2018, he received the first University of Granada Caja Rural de Granada Awards for Communication and Innovation in Digital Media. Fernando currently co-directs the Master in Health Promotion and Community Health, run by the Andalusian School of Public Health and the University of Granada. And he teaches in the Master in Educational Innovation at the University Carlos III of Madrid and the Master in Facilitation of Learning and Innovation at the University of Mondragon and Teen Labs. In the linguistic field, he teaches in the Master in Teaching Spanish as a Foreign Language and the Master in Bilingual Teaching, both at the University Pablo de Olavide in Seville. Fernando is currently participating among other projects in the European Commission's Joint Research Centers, Research Project COVID and Education 2021. His latest book is entitled Learning and Teaching in Times of Lockdown and has been published in September 2020 by Los Libros de la Catarata. The Global Competence Framework for Learning and Education in the Digital Age 2020, which Fernando coordinated for the Pro Futuro Foundation, has been translated into English, French, and Portuguese, and is used in the 40 countries where the foundation operates. In the media, he has collaborated with Radio Algeciras, Cadena Ser, The Conversation, and El Diario de la Educación. Fernando leads the research group HUM 840, Open Knowledge for Social Action at the University of Granada, and is also a founding partner and scientific advisor of Conecta 13, spin-off of the University of Granada, dedicated the cons to consultancy on education, professional development, and ICT. After all of this, you will see Fernando Trujillo in action, and so I hope that you enjoy. Fernando. Thank you, Thank you my dear friend. So good morning, everyone. Fernando has not been able to come, but I'm his cousin and he sent me his presentation and I hope I will be able to read it as well as he normally does. Well, did you sleep well? Did you sleep cool and uh, did you sleep? Well, I'm the first step uh, for tonight's dinner. That's the, the key point of this conference. So I'm the starting uh, moment of a very long day of learning and uh, uh, meeting interesting people. And today we will be uh, talking about borders and about learning and about languages. Three interesting topics which sometimes do not appear together. Well, first of all, obviously, thanks to the organization, to the organization of the conference, to the university, and to all of you for being here after such a long day yesterday. And I hope you will uh, move around the city uh, in the evening and late night. So thank you indeed for being for being here. Let me or let the computer or not. Yeah, yeah. Let me tell you a story. Human beings are stories, and we are human beings because we belong to places and because we have and we share stories. Let me tell you a story, a story about the place where I live, where I work, and uh, where I have the pleasure of uh, spending days and days with my students and so many nice people. That place is called, computer is going to uh, make me be slow, but that's good. That's a place called Ceuta. Ceuta is a very small city on the northern tip of Africa. It's a strange European city in Africa. That's what many people want us to, to, to say about, about Ceuta. Let me tell you a short story. I've been working there for 30 years now, and uh, I'm starting to become someone from, from Ceuta. If you haven't spent there at least 30 years, you don't really understand the place. It's, a, it's an interesting place for many reasons. This is one of the reasons. The difference in gross domestic product between Spain and Morocco is one of the largest differences in the world. In fact, if you leave out some countries about which we have certain uh, doubts about their statistics, 
perhaps it might be the highest difference in gross domestic product, larger than the one we have between the United States and Mexico. So between Morocco and uh, Spain, the difference is larger. If we compare, this is in euros, if we compare in uh, dollars, the difference with Mauritania or Mali, the difference is even larger. Well, that difference is an obvious pull factor, which makes unstoppable to receive people from Africa in Spain and Europe. That is a fact. It's not something we can stop and we shouldn't want to stop. But, whoopah. I will move up here, don't worry. Don't worry, I will see it. Thank you, thank you, Dad. From uh, the seventeenth, uh, the seventeenth to the twentieth, about one thousand five hundred people came swimming from Morocco to Ceuta. Totally unexpected uh, event. Uh, the city was not prepared to receive uh, these people. And we saw many situations of total disaster. We could have seen uh, many people die and suffer in that movement across the border from Morocco to, to Ceuta. From, uh, in those uh, uh, days, sorry, I said 1,000, it was 10,000 people coming, from, uh, coming to Ceuta. So a population of about 70,000 received 10,000 people and about 1,500 children coming swimming from Morocco to, to Ceuta, completely alone and accompanied by their families. And there also unexpectedly, they received an ethical response. They were received as a, human beings and they were received as people who were crossing in many occasions fooled by governments and by political decisions. You can see that young baby who was crossing on the back of her, his uh, mother. How can edu education react to events such as this one. The normal reaction could have been to hide the situation, to hide the possible problem of attending these children and these people. However, the law is quite clear. If you are in Spain or if you are in Europe, you must receive education, you must receive all the possible attentions and care that you may need. And quite unexpectedly too, in September, 
the government organized how to attend this population. And in November, considering that there were too many children for that first arrangement, many other teachers and schools were uh, prepared to attend educationally these students. In total, 17 primary and secondary classrooms were created and 11 upper secondary classrooms were organized to attend these students. They received schooling, they received education as soon as they were entering in Spain. And that was one of the first occasions in which this has happened. Unfortunately, in recent uh, weeks, we had a different, a completely different situation in Melilla, in which at least 37 people have been killed. And we still don't know the data and, we are, and the, the, the facts and the events have not been clarified by the two governments. But on this occasion, this statement by UNESCO, by the ancient declaration was true. Education is a public good, a fundamental human right, and the basis for guaranteeing the realization of other rights. On this occasion, that was made true. Because in fact, creating the learning opportunity for these 1,500 children was the, uh, the ethical response, the only way we could react as a rational democratic country. Ethics precedes action, any type of action. Also educational action, teaching action, learning action. Ethics precedes methodology. If your methodology is not ethical, then it shouldn't be used. It shouldn't be put into action. Ethics is the first step in any possible human action. Let's learn then another lesson from Ceuta, just to compare with this first situation. My friends Gordon and Yasone Fenov wrote that people always have to navigate between languages. We all do. We, we are doing it right now here. I'm speaking in English. So Luis has uh, used a little bit of, of Spanish. Perhaps then we will interact in some other languages. Well, that's always true. We always have to navigate between languages and seeing ourselves, contemplating ourselves as plurilingual beings is one of the highest ways of describing human beings today. This is the companion volume of the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages. However, the linguistic landscapes, one of the most interesting theoretical concepts that we are working with, reflect the reality beyond any type of motto, any type of beautiful sentence. And the linguistic landscape in Ceuta is also telling us that people always have to navigate between languages except at the school. School, schools in plural, tend to be spaces where languages have problems to be navigated, to be used comfortably. Let me tell you some data about Ceuta, which is a very multilingual city, but in which Darilla, the language spoken by the Mm, the majority of the population is minoritized. Darilla, the language of basically the Muslim community, has historically been forbidden at school. Now, a teacher, a good friend of mine, told me some weeks ago, fortunately, Darilla is not forbidden any longer. But that's not a good piece of news. Darilla is not forbidden because it's not necessary to forbid anything, because people has assumed that they cannot use it, and so they don't. Let's see some facts to complement this situation in my hometown. Some of the structural problems. First, the lowest rate of schooling from zero to three 
uh, years in Spain. So families don't uh, get their children schooled. But then when they do school them, we have the highest student teacher ratio in infant education from three to five years. So when they don't, when they are not at school, it's okay. When they come to a school, they don't have enough teachers. Third, we have a very high student teacher ratio in primary and secondary education in comparison to the rest of Spain. Fourth, fourth, come on. We have the second, the second highest rate of dropout, early school dropout in Spain, after Melilla, which is the uh, second African uh, city of Spain. So all the moves bring us to this conclusion. The school system in Ceuta uh, is supporting this idea, adapt or fail. And if you fail, you may leave and you may uh, enrich that early school dropout uh, rate. So failure is not genetic. It's a construction, it's a social construction and change is possible if we want to, if we have the political will to change things. But to do that, we must assume that education is first a caring ethical activity. And from that, we can move to technical issues. So we must clarify some questions, at least in both situations and then in the rest of our territories. Education for whom? Education with whom? Who is the learner? How do we call these learners? And you have the list of possible names that we give them to hide that they are children and learners. But all these are names which appear in different regulations, norms, and laws in Spain and Europe. And what about intersectionality? Male, female, LGBTQ plus learners, able-bodied students. Who is responsible for education? National, regional, local authorities, trained teachers, social workers. Do we have enough? Do we have social workers at schools in these situations? Volunteers, the whole society. What does learning and teaching mean in these situations? Which curriculum can we use in these situations? Whose curriculum? Where does teaching and learning take place? Which are the main, the main objectives of this curriculum? And what does plurilingualism really mean and how we will promote it or how will we use it to enhance learning? If we look through a plurilingual lens, we bring certain features to the fore. Agency, creativity, hybridity, learning, meaning making. Let's talk about that. This is what we call the axiological approach. Ethics first, then the rest of our educational issues. According to Gerd Biester, the philosophy uh, 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 the philosopher of education, there are three main domains of educational purpose. I will use them to establish which are our aims at school. First, subjectification, to become a self, to construct your identity, your ego, your position in the world and in relation to the world. Second, qualification, learning how to do something. And third, socialization, learning how to live in common places, to share those places with other people. So the question is, how can we promote uh, qualification? How can we promote socialization? How can we promote subjectification in these situations? Well, let me ask you some question about your colleagues at your home institution, not about you, because I know that you are the best, the top of the pop, but can you, can you now think of that colleague of yours 
who have remained here, who, who never comes to conferences organized in Valencia. Think about him or her, okay? What does learning or teaching mean to them? Not you, okay? To them. Which teaching paradigm do they live in? Okay, let's make an exercise of imagination. I think that many of them live in the paradigm of service provision. Let's call it service provision. The service provision describes the learner as a client who shows some needs and the teacher is there to provide them with services to satisfy those needs. And needs are broken down into pills and you can give the learner, here are your, your pills. Today's pills are red, blue and yellow, take them, okay? And each pill is independent from all the other pills. The red pill doesn't really affect the yellow or the green pill, but you take them in sequence, okay? And they are taken individualistically. These are your pills. That's not true. In fact, all the pills are the same for all the people. And teachers are the only people allowed to create pills, the only people who have studied pharmacy. And we manage the pills and take two of these today because I feel that you are needing it, okay? Well, good news, there is a different paradigm. Let me tell you, let's make a parenthesis. We are trying this new paradigm in three uh, parallel projects. First, an Erasmus Plus project called Migrimate, in which we are working with adult people, in which we are using media and digital artifacts to, to work from the idea of agency with adult people, adult migrants. Second, second, a national research project that we have been awarded quite recently, and we will start in September to uh, make our research coming to the beginning, to infant education with this very same ideas. And, and in the middle, a project that we are, in which we are working with four school centers, three primary schools and one secondary school with the ideas of the language school project and the uh, digital school project. I will talk about it in a few minutes. So we are making a rehearsal of a new paradigm in which we are not content providers. This is what we call the asset, the asset paradigm. And the starting point of this paradigm is thinking that we must move from a deficit theory what do, uh, what are these learners missing? What, what, which are the things they don't know to think that they have assets and, they, they, and that they know many things and that they can learn many different things. So from the deficit theory to the awareness and deployment of assets and affordances. Two basic moves if you want to understand this axiological approach, we will practice these moves. So get ready to move. Are you ready to move? They are very, very easy moves, okay? So move your shoulder, get ready. Okay, first move for an axiological approach in education, easy to do. We will practice it in, in pairs, okay? First watch and then we practice. Something like that. Okay, so now you can stand up and start practicing. Isn't it beautiful? It's beautiful, difficult, but beautiful. That's care, care. And the second move, be ready, okay? The second move, you will practice it with me, okay? It's very simple. I will need four, five, from four to five volunteers. Very easy, don't worry, okay? And I'm out. That's it. So four or five people, I will ask you to stand up and do this to me, okay? Easy. Okay, volunteers? Well, not today, not today. So care and assets, care and assets. 
all learning implies two processes. One is social, the second is mental. At school, normally we only consider the mental one and we forget about the interaction with the environment, with other people, the social side of learning. And the question is that as we forget about the social side of learning, we keep children sitting in rows to learn mathematics. Useless and also uh, totally, totally senseless. They learn better when they are applying, let's say mathematics, we could talk about anything you prefer when they are working it in a meaningful social situation. So learning means change, but change as a consequence of participating in a situation and an experience that allows us to acquire knowledge or new skills. So learning means change. And as a consequence of that change, we gain social, cultural, linguistic capital. But we need our students to invest in our proposal. We are not content providers. This is the movie you will watch today. No, this is my proposal, my suggestion. Will you invest your time, your effort, your cognitive resources in this proposal? That is the key question in the 21st century. Investment of the learner in our proposals. Investment that help them to make sense of a learning situation, to own that learning situation, and finally, to become agents in that learning situation. Agency is, by the way, the key word to understand the assets paradigm. Agency as the capacity of people to act upon, to influence and to transform activities and circumstances, the environment. The Common European Framework already suggested that in 2001, and then again in 2018, I will move fast about that because you all know the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages. I hope you will read it every day at night. I read it to my children every day. We are now in chapter nine about evaluation. Very interesting. So in these border situations, in this peculiar context, we are rehearsing well, this idea of experiential asset learning, affordances, investment, agency to promote learning. And we are using traditional resources, project-based learning, multiliteracies, and the whole school approach. Project-based learning understood as a move from engagement and challenge to the creation of something and the dissemination of that final product. We understand that the challenge is the engine of learning because the project must move you if you understand that it is relevant, that you can make sense of it, that you own it. It's the engine that promotes ownership, sense-making and agency. Planning is the moment when we sit down and we make decisions about what we need uh, about what we want to learn, about how we can uh, develop the project. Implementation as a moment in which we transform realities in which we interact with the environment. And finally, the closure in which we, in which we uh, develop and which we hand out our final product, which is then disseminated. And at the same time, during the whole project, we develop self-assessment, uh, co-assessment, and iterative evaluation. We developed some years ago a canvas to design projects, and now we are using this canvas in this border context. And uh, this canvas has fortunately been uh, tested in real life situations in, I would say, hundreds of schools in in Spain, you can download it. It's Creative Commons license. You can change it, you can modify it, adapt it as you prefer. 
the idea is that we design backwards from the final product and, uh, and uh, the results towards the tasks and the needs to perform those, those tasks. But then we are not working with monolingual speakers because monolingual speakers do not really exist at all now. So we are working with multilingual speakers and their multiple repertoires. So we are using two other concepts which are fundamental to understand a border situation. The first one is translanguaging. The second one is transsemiotizing, which for us is an expansion, a 21st century expansion of translanguaging. Translanguaging and, translang and transsemiotization. Transsemiotization are naturally occurring human phenomenon. Let me make a break. I have just two minutes to make a break and let you and, and tell you a story. A month ago, I was in Madrid and uh, after a, a lecture and I was waiting to get my train. I was in a cafeteria and there I saw two young uh, people, uh, about 80 more or less. Uh, uh, it was a man and a woman, 80 year old, and they were getting to know each other. He spoke English, she spoke Spanish, and they couldn't understand each other. But they were getting to know each other and they were using their phones because elder people know how to use smartphones and they were using their phones and their situation to understand each other. And he was telling her, for example, I can't remember, how many children do you have? And she said, and then he took his phone and he showed his own children and grandchildren pictures. And then she understood what she, he was asking. And they were having a conversation only transsemiotizing with very few linguistic support because in fact, they, don't, uh, they didn't know each other's languages. So, Translanguaging is today one of the basic concepts to understand how human beings communicate and get along with other human beings. The only thing that we have done is to include the idea of transsemiotizing, to broaden the focus from languages to other resources and to other skills. So translanguaging, transsemiotizing, and multiliteracies are the key for a real experiential learning in a border context. And I would say in any, in any educational context. Some year ago, we made a research we called digital artifacts and we collected digital artifacts uh, school teachers were creating with their students. And now we, are, we have joined this idea of digital artifacts with the idea of universal design for learning. People are not handicapped. We create barriers which stop, which prevent people from moving, from being, from belonging, or from learning. When we realize that those barriers can be demolished or at least reduced, then we are practicing universal design for learning. And we are using digital artifacts to promote universal design for learning, which means different ways of representing information. Secondly, secondly, that's it. Different ways of expression of participation. And third, using engaging, really inclusive methodologies. And thirdly, and just, and we finish with that idea, we are using a whole school approach. A border situation is a very complex situation, politically, socially, economically, also educationally difficult, complex, more than difficult, complex, with many different elements to consider. If we want to intervene, if we want to uh, be and work in that situation, the individualistic, uh, I would say heroic approach leads you to heart attack. So only the whole school approach 
and in the case of languages, the language school project can help you organize what we call an agreed and coordinated arrangement of the school's resources to attend to those multiple elements to consider in a border situation. The school language project is a minimum viable project in which the whole school community make decisions on how to learn and teach languages, on how to show languages, how to make them visible, how to show respect and appreciation for languages in a school context. We also designed uh, a canvas, a similar, a similar one as the, the, the previous uh, canvas. And uh, we have used this canvas from uh, 2008 until today, almost uh, 15 years, to design school, language school projects in many different situations, situations in which we have European migrations in the Costa del Sol uh, area, in the south of Spain, situations in which we have different uh, two official languages, as in the Basque country, uh, Comunidad Valenciana, and other areas in Spain. So this canvas too has been widely tested and uh, proved to be useful to design uh, school projects, language school projects. So the conclusion for my lecture, because the organization asked me to, to have time to talk and to make this a more lively uh, discussion. And plurilingualism, which is a neologism which does not exist, don't look it up, and plurilingualism is impossible today, is impossible nowadays. It shouldn't be an objective, it cannot be an objective, it's not a good way of describing reality, social realities. We are all plurilinguals, and border situations are giving us the opportunity to learn how to make us all richer through plurilingual approaches, through axiological approaches. Two quotations to finish, not so fast, please. Plurilingualism stresses the fundamental role of dealing with cows as a natural positive state where individuals feel free to make personal and creative use of all the linguistic and cultural resources. Reality is chaotic. Plurilingualism is a way of organizing that chaos in our minds and then in our social linguistic encounters. And the second and last uh, quotation, the democratization of plurilingual education requires the adoption of educational policies that make enriched foreign language learning experiences available to all type of students, regardless of socioeconomic status. So what I have tried with this uh, lecture is to show you how a border situation uh, the border context of Ceuta can provide concepts, methodologies, suggestions, which can be exported, which can be moved to different, to many different situations which shouldn't, which are not border situation. I hope you may, you have in the, found some of these ideas interesting that, that, and that you will be able to implement them in your hometown situations. The, the final idea is that we are not here to consolidate privileges or inequalities. In fact, we are here to fight them and to build more democratic societies. So the future is open for you to build it. Thank you. And I will be very happy to hear your questions or your uh, doubts about my, my lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Indel.
Okay. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, my name is Patrick. I'm from Montreal, Canada. Um, I'm a UNESCO chairholder in curriculum development and maybe some quick clarifications. And I'm, I'm, I really enjoyed the last, uh, well, some of the last quotes that you mentioned. Um, education is highly politics and politicized. And what were the decisions made by Spain government about I would say uh, refugees integration about languages about which curriculum who are the teachers and and how did they manage this well this situation throughout your project you mean uh, in may 2021 uh, the first uh, uh, the first moments were very chaotic as you can imagine because it means that one seventh of the population had appeared suddenly, unexpectedly, and uh, the problem was how to attend and uh, to provide for food and lodging and so on. But I think that considering the normal speed of reaction of governments and the suspicions they have about providing the ethical response I think that in this particular event, the response was the adequate one because uh, these people came in May 2021 and uh, they were received. And they started working with them. I'm now talking about children, basically, 1,500, which is, which is a lot for such a tiny, place in the in the on the earth and uh, in september the secretary of state had already uh, arranged for all these schooling to be created so i would say it was an adequate response the question for me is okay but have we learned something about that situation are we for example creating common knowledge about this situation or from this situation? Uh, have we made research about this situation? Are we creating, uh, are we training uh, people to know how to react in case these situations are repeated? That is a problem for me because the answer to all these questions is no. We, we have not created common knowledge about this from this event and uh, that's something we are trying to solve from the university but normally university is not at the core of political responses sometimes unfortunately sometimes fortunately okay so uh, i think that it was the minimum ethical response we could provide uh, we should have been prepared well, first, it should have never happened and uh, uh, moves should be more rational across borders, first things to say. And uh, the proof was the event in Melilla one month ago, okay, which is radically different from all perspectives, okay, violence, death, and so on. But then the problem now is that if that move of uh, human beings happen again, perhaps we wouldn't be prepared again. And we should be prepared. That is my conclusion about this, about this event. Acknowledging that it is not easy to be, to be prepared because in fact, both cities are so small that it's, it's difficult to have the resources ready just in case, but as a country, we should have those resources prepared. For the streaming. Oh yeah, that's right. Well, uh, we have a question from the chat uh, from Vina Balgovin from Mauritius. Uh -huh. She wants to know if teachers have been successful in using the translator devices in class with high number 
of young learners if they used any translation devices? Uh, first, fortunately, the ratio of students and teachers was not very high. In this uh, uh, case we have described, actually the, the rate was kept under 15 students. So resources were provided to have, I think, quality teaching. And they have been using computers, not only for translation, because many of these children can translanguage. So they can use some words of Spanish, some words of Darilla, some words of Arabic, some words of French. So I think that the question is not if they are dependent on the device, but that they've been able to translanguage as in face-to-face -face situation. At least uh, that's what we have been able to, to, to get from the observation of these lessons. Communication was much more fluent than we expected in, this, in these schools. Okay? However, computers is a, are a, a very interesting resource, but I wouldn't say for translation. We have been using it um, to create things. And that is one of the interesting conclusions of it. How they can create not only PowerPoint presentations, but to create uh, video clips. Because in fact, we tend to think that uh, Western societies live in a multimedia uh, atmosphere and that someone who has, who, someone who has migrated come from another um, uh, planet and they live in the same multimedia uh, context that we do. And so we have been creating particularly video clips in which they can, they can translanguage, in which they can use different languages, perhaps more than using the devices to, for translation. And if I may. Oh, well. I'm just curious, um, when you were describing the situation, uh, I think mostly, if not um, all the time, you used Africa uh, as the the location of this uh, uh -huh. um, enclave uh, instead of Morocco. Uh -huh. and, and obviously, Morocco is in Africa, of course. But I'm wondering, was that is this intentional? Is this um, the way that Spain sees? these two enclaves as connected to Africa in, in, a, in a broader sense? Not in a broader sense, in a geographical sense. They are in Africa. They, uh, they are on the northern tip of Africa. They are not located in Europe, if that is the, 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 yeah, uh, the I mean, question. I, I know, I've, I've, I've actually been there and, and ah, I'm, great. I'm based now in Casablanca. And great. It's beautiful, very cold water, so. Uh, <laughs> um, but it, it's it's strange. It was just uh, it kind of um, made me curious to know why not use uh, Morocco as a more uh, as a smaller context as a sort of more specific uh, location description. Um, I, I don't really uh, think I'm. I understand the question, but well, uh, Ceuta is not Morocco. We we are adjacent to, to Morocco, mm -hmm. but people who are coming to Ceuta are not exclusively from Morocco. Mm -hmm. They come from many other so different Sarah, African Africa, countries, yeah. and uh, including uh, in, uh, Asian countries who are moving across Africa to 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 the borders. So I'm trying to keep the, the words uh, adjusted to the, to the context. Okay. We are receiving people from Senegal, from Mali, from Guinea, uh, Togo, and so on. And they are not uh, exclusively from Morocco, which obviously there are many people coming from Morocco too. For example, unaccompanied children normally come exclusively from Morocco because you can imagine what it means to migrate through Africa being a child, which sometimes happen, by the way. Um, so unaccompanied children normally come from Morocco and normally from the northern area of Morocco, up uh, from Casablanca. 
because as you know the 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 uh, distribution uh, in in Morocco is contrary as in many other uh, countries in Europe the north is poorer than the south mm -hmm. and so we have many unaccompanied children coming from the north of Morocco okay thank you you're welcome. It makes sense that it is a, a bit broader with sub-Saharan Africans also using that route. Thank yeah. you. It's not easy for us. And uh, when we mix it with languages and then with religions to keep all the concepts uh, uh, somehow clear for us to think about. I mean, is this child a Darija speaker? Is he a, a Muslim believer? Is he a Moroccan uh, citizen? So. Uh, we try to to be very specific with the with the concepts that you know all right thank you i was just going to follow on, on on that because you emphasize border you're looking at the situation at a border mm. and you have a spanish city and you're looking at the border uh, of the crossing over it could be america at the could mexican be. border it could be greece and thessalonica sure. it could be anywhere so I, I, it's interesting uh, that it's the border situation you're dealing with and how do you deal with those humans uh, that are now the responsibility of that particular uh, mm -hmm. geographical space. But I think what the spirit of that was, was um, that what you say goes for everybody. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, the kind of the uh, educational values mm -hmm. um, is something that uh, all educators, whether they're on the border or not, uh, should you know, uh, prepare because every classroom, even if it thinks it is homogenous, is diverse, you know, in complex mm -hmm. ways. So I think you've got that double thing going. And it would be nice to uh, extrapolate from the border situation, which is very specific and very important, that these are now transcendent mm -hmm. values and practices of learning by design, you know, the, the role of the teacher. Um, you know that you know I could read all that in what you were saying. So I want to thank you because I think you did a double thing there without emphasizing it. Well, thanks for your question because uh, it invites me to clarify. For us, the border situation is a test is a stress test. So the idea is do not create unethical responses because it is a border situation. Don't teach different because it is a border situation. Let's try ethical ways of teaching in perhaps the most complex situation you may find, which could be Greece, which could be Turkey, which could be in many countries in Africa or Asia. Okay, so for us, the important thing is to prove that these methodologies uh, go through the stress test of working in a border situation where our collective um, imagination would create uh, extraordinary methodologies which may become unethical responses. That is the idea behind it. So for us, the border is the stress test, okay? If they work here, they may work in Valencia or they may work anywhere else. That is a question. Um, Thanks to you. First of all, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, Ali Borjan from San Francisco State. Um, the, the, the key point that I'm taking away is the change that teachers need to make in their philosophy of teaching from being a service paradigm to an asset paradigm. We went through um, four years of nightmare from um, Trump era, mm -hmm. in which teacher perspectives were seen as um, anti-immigrant. Mm -hmm. Our society became more and more anti-immigrant because of the of the um, the views that were mm -hmm. pushed. Now, how do we train teachers to have that sensibility, that idea of we are all human, we have rights, and we need to have proper education for all people in the society. I'm very thankful that Spain responded very positively, but we're not responding positively in many other parts of the world, including the United States. Hmm. So what is 
what can I do as a teacher educator to create the vision mm -hmm. that the teacher would want to pr provide the support and not see the, the students as others. And if, if it is my child, it's okay. But if it's somebody mm -hmm. else's children, it's not my problem. That, that paradigm change, it's necessary. But I thank you so much for bringing this all together to a very, very uh, intelligent manner. Thank you. No, thank you for your question and, and thank you for surviving the Trump administration, which, which I presume was a very strenuous ex effort. Yeah. And uh, for us, but we don't have a final solution. For us, the key is the dissemination of the products that students, learners are creating so that they can show that they really have assets and that they do not belong to that deficit theory which was describing them as people who do not know things. They do not know the official language in Spain. They do not know about the curriculum. So they come naked, academically, curricular, uh, academically naked. And that's not true. We are working with adult uh, people, with adult migrants who have crossed Africa. How can they not know things? Only surviving to that travel is such, a, uh, such an effort, such an experience, which makes them come really full and enriched of uh, important knowledge. So for us, in a very humble way, the key is to prove, because I agree with you, this does not uh, happen uh, magically. It has to be proved that these learners first can learn, because many of us think that they cannot and do not want uh, to learn. So first, they can learn. They have the resources to learn in all senses, cognitively, socially, anything. And third, they produce very inter interesting, we could say intellectual outputs, which are comparable to, to other products that we are producing in normalized uh, school situations. So for us, that moment of dissemination, which I included in the presentation, but it's included in the project-based learning approach, for us, it's particularly important because it helps us say, okay, this is what they do. Where are their deficits? And uh, let's change our view to consider their assets and how they can use the affordances that the city, the environment, or their own life experiences are providing to enhance and to enrich, to empower those assets that they have. So it's true, it's not easy. And I wouldn't lie if I say that everybody in Ceuta or Melilla or every, everywhere else is convinced about this change of paradigm. But the problem is that it's a move, it's a change which is totally necessary at least in these situations, and that is something peculiar, peculiar in a border context, you cannot work in any other way, or you will not get interesting results or ethical results. But that's uh, somehow we become social activists and teaching becomes social activism because you need to convince people around you that this is it's feasible, it's possible, and it is necessary. And for us, dissemination is part of that, of that route. And coming here is also part of that route. Coffee or question? <laughs> or both, I mean, we can have coffee on questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.